I will spend the next two minutes giving a very short introduction on the disease that I have dedicated the past 12 years of my life studying, and then I will go on and tell you a short summary of what we have been doing at the other side of the Atlantic over the past few years. So, this is a primary myocardial disease that, uh, as <coughs> most of you should know, it is characterized clinically by frequent ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, and pathologically by the gradual degeneration of cardiac myocytes and their replacement with fat and fibrous tissue. It uh, affects, on average, one in 2,000 individuals in the general population, although in certain regions of the world it is the number one cause of sudden death amongst young individuals and particularly those engaged in strenuous exercise. And it was originally described as a right ventricular disease and hence given the name arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. But the fact that uh, recently we have identified left dominant and biventricular forms, it has prompted the adoption of the broader term arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So about 60% of our patients have one or more mutations in genes that encode for desmosomal proteins. And a desmosome is essentially a, an intercellular complex which joins, which connects adjacent cells. And it contains members of the cadherin family, namely desmocolin 2 and desmoglein 2, which essentially span the membranes of the cardiac myocytes and they hold them together. And then it contains members of the plaquin and the armadillo family. This is a protein that I'm very interested in. You'll hear all about it in a second, placoglobin, placophyllin 2 and desmoplakin. And these form complexes that essentially link the cadherins to the intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton. Now, in order for, for somebody to actually dissect uh, the mechanisms of disease pathogenesis, then one needs to have a very good understanding of the human disease. And we, we are cardiac pathologists, so for us, understanding the human disease is getting pieces of hearts in paraffin blocks. And although this is, this method of preservation, it, it has, it, it, like, like the vast majority of the world tissue bank, this is formal and fixed paraffin embedded heart material, which it did not make it possible for us to do cutting edge technological experiments, but we could still gain an enormous amount of information, essentially just by studying the distribution of key proteins by immunohistochemistry. So we started over 10 years ago, and the, the first thing that we happened to observe is that this protein that I spoke about earlier, placoglobin, it seems to be gone from the intercalated discs in heart samples in patients that have arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, regardless of the underlying pathogenic mutation. So it does not matter if the patient has a mutation in placoglobin, in desmoplakin, in desmocolin 2, or in no gene at all that we could identify. Still, if we look at a piece of the heart under the microscope, then placoglobin does not make it to the junctions. However, it does not get degraded. It still remains in the heart, but it is translocating from where it should be at the membrane to the inside of the cell, to the cytoplasm or to the nucleus. Now, the second thing that we observed was a similar reduction in this white signal that you see in the junctions for connexin 43. That is the major um, gap junction protein in the heart ventricles. And this gap junction remodeling it is by no means specific to this disease. And as a matter of fact, it has been shown in pretty much every type of heart disease that has been examined in all cardiomyopathies. There is, however, one fundamental difference. In other cardiomyopathies, like hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy, this gap junction remodeling, it happens late in the course of the disease, after the heart has already been structurally remodeled. But in ARVC, it, these changes happen early. Essentially, you can get a child even before it manifests the disease phenotype. And if you have a chance to look at the myocardium, then you will see that connexin 43 is missing from the junctions even before the person is actually sick. Now, the third feature we identified was a um, high level of cardiac myocyte apoptosis. And uh, blue is essentially the nuclei, and then green it, it is a marker for DNA fragmentation. And then when we superimpose one picture on the other, then we get these white dots, which essentially is showing you which cells in this 
screen are actually undergoing apoptosis. And this was a feature of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy that was shown by pathologists a very long time ago, but we were able to confirm this finding essentially using molecular techniques like tunnel assays. And the fourth thing we showed was inflammation. And when I'm talking about inflammation, I mean cytokines, pro-inflammatory markers that were in, at insanely high levels, both in the plasma of the patients that have ACM compared to patients that have other forms of heart disease, but also being secreted by cardiac myocytes themselves. So this is immunoperoxidase. It's essentially a technique similar to what I showed you before, the blue pictures with the white junctions. The difference is that this is based uh, on an enzyme which amplifies the signal, so you can get to see differences in expression levels, even in tissues that do not express too much of the protein that you are looking for. So essentially, we were looking at a disease that was characterized by four fundamental molecular features. Placoglobin was being re redistributed from the junctions to the inside of the cell. There was gap junction remodeling, apoptosis, and inflammation. But essentially, this is as far as this paraffin-embedded myocardium could take us. So then we had to go to the lab, and we had to create a model. So what we made in collaboration with Callum McRae at the Brigham Hospital in, in Boston is a fish model of ACM. And now, this fish, by, by 48 hours, post fertilizer okay, and this fish, first of all, they, they are transgenics, and they express placoglobin that has this mutation only in their heart. Now, this mutation in patients, it causes Naxos disease. And the reason that we picked that, I mean, Naxos disease is a triad. It, it, it has cardiomyopathy, it, it has cutaneous abnormalities, and it shows hair abnormalities as well. We only expressed this mutation in the heart, so the fish did not have any extra cardiac manifestation of the disease. but we knew that this mutation is 100% penetrant. So there was, because usually with ARVC mutations, I mean, you can, the, the same family members can have the same mutation. Some manifest the disease, others don't. But with this particular mutation, I mean, essentially everybody who is a homozygote carrier of this is sick. So which is why we made a fish which by 48 hours post-fertilization, it was already sick. So it had bradycardia, it had reduced cardiac output, it had reduced stroke volume, and it died suddenly, much younger than the litter mates that did not carry the transgene. Now, what, and essentially within five weeks, this fish ended up having cardiomegaly, peripheral edema, cachexia. So within, I mean, this is a phenotype that you can see with a naked eye. I mean, the heart of the fish by five weeks of age, it is so big that you don't even need any kind of tests to figure out which fish in your tank have arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and which don't. You just look at them and you can pinpoint at which fish has a heart that's sticking out of its chest. But what you could do with this fish was essentially this. So see, if you get 5,000 fish that have ARVC, you see the heart is sticking out, and you dump a library of 5,000 orphan drugs in these tanks, and then you wait a week. And at the end of the week, the majority of these orphan drugs, they had killed the fish. Some of them had no effect on the cardiac phenotype at all, and here was one drug out of 5,000, this thing, that fixed the fish. Not only does it fix the fish, it prevents the disease as well. Add this drug two drops in the water of a tank that has fish with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. If they are very young, they will never develop the disease. If they already have the disease, it will revert back to their physiological measures. So, cool, we cured arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in fish. Okay. <laughs> Not good enough. <laughs> what, what we had to do next was see if this drug actually works in a live mammalian model, something that would be a little more close to our patients. So we tried it on two different mice. This is proudly my mouse, and it is a, the same principle with the fish. So again, in the heart, it expresses the exact same mutation in placoglobin, and this is a mouse that was made by Dan Judge at the Johns Hopkins, and it is a more sophisticated technologically mouse. It is a knock-in mutant desmoglein 2. Essentially what the Hopkins has done is they took the two copies of normal desmoglein 2, they erased them, and they replaced them by two copies that make mutant desmoglein 2. So let's take this mouse by mouse, okay? I'll start with my mouse. <laughs> so my mouse, if you look at it at about three months of age, it is absolutely fine. It doesn't look sick. It doesn't have any 
Arrhythmias, it doesn't have histological lesions, but look at it under the microscope, and you can see that it already has features of disease. It already has anomalies. So, for instance, placoglobin, the bright red signal, it's gone from the junctions. Connexin 43, it's depressed at the junctions. I see a lot of cytokines being secreted by the heart, and also there is apoptosis. So it's the same <coughs> four fundamental features of disease that we first looked at at the patients. These are recapitulated by this mouse. The mouse gets a little older, at about six months of age. You, the heart is still normal. It appears to be normal in terms of histology, but now they might start having arrhythmias. So they have premature ventricular contractions, they have stretches of ventricular tachycardia. Wait a little longer until the mouse gets to nine months of age, and then it is in heart failure. I mean, and it has even more arrhythmias. It starts having massive histological lesions. Mice usually don't have fat in their heart, so essentially the lesions that we are talking about which would be the equivalent of a fibro-fatty lesion in our patient. It's just scar, but still, it's, it's a massive replacement. The heart gets much larger. There is thinning of the right ventricular free wall, and <coughs> essentially this, these mice will, will die suddenly at any point in between six months of age and nine months of age. And if, if they make it through that stretch, then they end up dying of biventricular heart failure. So let's start injecting them with the new drug. SB216762, which I will refer to as SB2 to make our life a little easier. So start injecting these mice with SB2 every day, intraperitoneally over 42 days. What you see at the end, at these three-month-old animals, is that the distribution of placoglobin is fixed, the distribution of connexin 43 is fixed, there is no apoptosis, and there is no inflammation. So the drug seems to be working fine when the animal is still really young and it has molecular abnormalities but no real disease manifestation yet. So we cannot really, we couldn't use this experiment to see what the drug does in these endpoints. We had to use a little older animals. So we get them at six months of age. And interestingly, if you, give, if you start at six months of age, you give the drug for seven weeks straight, then at the end, these animals have almost no arrhythmias, and they have not developed any lesions. So these are their brothers and sisters, the wild type, the, the, the mutant litter mates, which did not get the drug, and these are the mice that actually got the drug. But if you wait a little longer, and you start the drug at nine months of age, it's too late. The animals will still have arrhythmias, and perhaps the lesions will not get any larger, but whatever destruction is already there, it cannot be cured. So if we want to summarize these three experiments, what we learned from them is that subcellular abnormalities, like redistribution of placoglobin, redistribution of connexin 43, these precede and they likely promote arithmogenesis. So at this stage, when it is still rather early, if you do give SB2, then you can stop the arrhythmias and the lesions. But later on, after the heart has already been significantly structurally remodeled, this drug is of little value. The reason being that now the arrhythmias are most likely dependent on anatomic substrates, which there's no way that we can reverse all the scar that is already there. So that's mouse number one. Here is the second mouse. The second mouse, it gets sick. So this is, is a mouse that has two mutant copies of Desmoglein 2. This mouse gets much sicker, much younger than the placoglobin one. Uh, as a matter of fact, by three weeks of age, it starts showing signs of disease. And by two months of age, it is already in this state where the heart has massive <laughs> fibrous replacement and there is a dramatic drop in ejection fraction. So the mutant mouse goes down to 45% as opposed to 85%, that is the normal ejection fraction for a wild-type mouse. There is prolongation of QRS, which is showing that there is more ventricular ectopy. There are, again, arrhythmias, PVCs, and ventricular tachycardia. Connexin 43 and placoglobin are gone from the intercalated discs. So, at three weeks of age, if you start giving this drug to the animals every day in an injectable form over 13 weeks, then at the end, 
Echocardiography showed a dramatic restoration of the ejection fraction, which goes back up to 74%, as opposed to 45 in the mice that did not get the drug. Then the duration of the QRS is restored. There are no more arrhythmias. There, is, there are no histological lesions in the heart. And guess what? Placoglobin and connection 43 come back to the cell junctions. Now, this is this mouse. Okay, the one that has both mutant alleles for desmoglein 2, the one that gets sick so early. However, the Hopkins also has that mouse. And this only carries one copy of mutant desmoglein. Now, if this mouse is essentially treated like a couch potato, if you just leave it on a cage where it does nothing other than eat and drink water, this mouse is going to be fine. I mean, it will not have arrhythmias, it will not have lesions, and even at the subcellular level, it does not show changes in the distribution of placoglobin and connection 43. However, take this animal. If I managed to press play here, it would be interesting. Mm. Yeah. No. That's supposed to be a movie, which is supposed to show you mice swimming. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity. How, how do I press play? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Ah, cool. Thank you. Okay, so take this animal, the heterozygous model, and uh, subject it to something equivalent to what we would call endurance exercise. That's 90 minutes of swimming every day, Monday to Friday, over 12 weeks, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and at the end of this, though, the mouse is sick. It now has arrhythmias, it now has lesions, and, it, and placoglobin and connection 43 are gone from the junctions. Uh, you will be surprised to hear that if you actually make the mouse swim, but you inject it with SB2 at the same time, it is protected. It will never get sick. But it's this paradigm, I mean, before we get to the drug again, this paradigm is showing, I don't know, I mean, to me it was interesting because it showed that people that are carriers, and we consider them to have no disease manifestation whatsoever, if you do take these people and you subject them to endurance exercise regimes, then chances are that they will actually start manifesting disease. <coughs> so before I close this talk, uh, you might wonder, what is this drug? <laughs> so SB216763 came out to clinical trials over 20 years ago as an analog of lithium, and it was used to treat patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Now, like lithium, this drug is annotated as a specific inhibitor of that, of glycogen synthesis kinase 3 beta. I'll come back to that in 10 seconds. But unlike lithium, it really didn't help patients with neurological disorders. So it didn't even make it to phase two clinical trials, and it remained in a library of orphan drugs for over 20 years, until it cured the fish with ARVC. So, the question is, I mean, what, how does it do it? So I will take you on a very short uh, um, road in the cell. I won't bore you with a lot of signaling pathways, but essentially, placoglobin can be found at three places in the cell, like we said at the beginning of the talk. You can find it at the membrane, you can find it inside the cell, in the cytoplasm, and you can find it in the nucleus. Now, placoglobin has a cousin, another protein that has some overlapping functions with placoglobin and some distinct functions, they do look pretty similar. It's called beta-catenin. Now, essentially, when placoglobin or beta-catenin find themselves inside the cell, if this pathway, which is called the winged signaling pathway, if it is not working, if, if it doesn't have ligands that activate it, essentially what's going to happen to these proteins in the cell is they get recognized by that, by GSK3 beta. And as a result, they get phosphorylated, and they get targeted for degradation. Now, if this pathway is active, then GSK3 beta does not, is inhibited. So it will not degrade beta-catenin and placoglobin, and it will allow it to go into the nucleus and drive expression of a number of genes. Now, what we have come to believe is that in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, this kinase GSK3 beta is overactive. So I will not take you down molecular pathways of activity assays, but essentially the bottom line of this is that if, uh, even if this drug never makes it to, to clinical trials, even if we never actually get to give it to patients and cure them, it did teach us one important lesson which we would never 
have had if it wasn't for all this story I just shared with you. I mean, it seems that this molecule, GSK3-beta, it has a key role in the pathway of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. I mean, inhibit this hyperactive GSK3-beta, you fix the arrhythmias, you fix the lesions, you don't have redistribution of proteins, you don't have inflammation, you don't have apoptosis. So somehow, this molecule is pretty important. And it's, I mean, ideally, I would like this drug to come to the market. It, I mean, the, the studies that we have, the preliminary data that we have, it looks that the, the dosages that we should give to a human to achieve what we did with the mouse could perhaps be toxic for the human body. So it's not, but however, the fact that, you know, see, we know the target, and there are 12 different inhibitors of GSK3-beta out there which are commercially available, and I mean, this gives us, we have the models, and we know the molecule that we have to target in order to cure the disease. So eventually, this means that in the future, we can definitely find a GSK3-beta inhibitor, which will not be toxic for the patients, and it will still take care of all the abnormalities we just spoke about. Thank you very much for your attention.